and uh, Lisa's going to, as uh, Mike said, she's, she's going to talk about the nuts and bolts. Uh, Lisa Gonzalez Kramer is uh, environmental scientist and project manager for the reforestation project. Um, I don't know how long she's been doing that. Uh, Lisa, how long have you been doing that? Uh, I started at the end of 2010. Good, okay. So and uh, be Great. Before then, she was involved in reforestation efforts uh, in Indiana, of all places. I, but uh, she's transferred that technology successfully to San Diego County, and now she's going to tell you all about it. So there you go. It's all yours, Lisa. Thank you so much, Richard. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with uh, everyone today. Um, I am uh, very aware that uh, with, there are many more experts on the call than, than myself. And um, I, so I, I kind of take this um, presentation with some uh, uh, trepidation because um, I know that there Don't are, be bashful. Uh, Don't be bashful, Lisa. Come on now. <laughs> but, I'm, I'm tuning out now. Bye. Okay. Thanks, Richard. So, I, but I do want to acknowledge that um, we do have some experts that are guiding this project. Um, specifically, um, Mike Wells, as you can tell, is just a, a wealth of information and has been on the project. Um, since its inception, and uh, it con continues to uh, guide it and give us uh, a lot of scientific uh, expertise. And I'll mention uh, some uh, registered professional foresters that are also working with us. So um, with that said, um, let me see. Let me just uh, forward here. Okay. So um, as we're, uh, as we're um, Reforesting uh, Cuyamaca, I just want to bring up the, um, the photo of the Sear Fire. This particular uh, photo is uh, facing um, west from Cuyamaca Peak. We're at an elevation of about 6,500 feet. And uh, so that is uh, just a, a, a wall of fire um, uh, coming across the landscape towards the park. Um, and this is similar to Mike's, Mike's uh, post-fire infrared uh, aerial photo as well. I want to just um, use the arrow here. And what, what this area is, I just want to point out, is basically the, um, what's, what's showing up as remaining canopy um, after the fire. And so, um, you know, this, this particular photo was taken just a couple of days, um, I don't know, maybe a week or so after the fire. And essentially, um, it's showing up a lot more. The, the red, of course, is the, the live foliage. And it's showing up a lot more um, foliage that, is, uh, that was currently still green at the time and subsequently, um, you know, died. This area really is the... Um, it, it contains the largest um, source of genetic stock left in the park. Uh, it is on Cuyamaca Peak. I don't know if I mentioned that. And it also contains the last remaining uh, sugar pine stand uh, canopy in San Diego County. And uh, so it is, um, although it's not technically part of the reforestation project, it's the one thing that keeps me up at night as uh, we look for ways to protect this particular area and um, you know, make sure that we don't lose it through lightning strikes or, or any other source of ignition. Um, but essentially, you can see, again, um, there are not a lot of uh, patches of remaining um, intact canopy, can canopy other than this. So the extent of the habitat uh, destruction really um, as Mike said, over 51% of the montane mixed conifer forest uh, was burned by wildfire between uh, 2002 and 2007. So over a period of you know six years, and most of it was burned in high-intensity wildfire fires, like what occurred in in the Cedar Fire. And uh, of course, Cuyamaca held about 20% uh, of that um, mixed conifer forest, and it's basically about almost 10,000 acres, and um, and that kind of puts into context the importance of this restoration project um, because we are losing a significant um, habitat and um, you know, putting that in context of, of why it's so important to, to reforest this area and to reestablish that habitat. 
is one thing that I always uh, you know keep in mind as we're as we're undertaking this uh, really great effort. It's um it's just a something that I keep in mind. So um, I want to just say that um, normally the um, Cedar Fire, um, the California State po uh, Parks post fire um, policy is that um, we historically don't um, treat, I mean we treat unscheduled wildland fires as natural disturbances. And our policy is, has been uh, basically to just let nature take its course. But as you know, Mike explained in, in his presentation, this uh, Cedar Fire really was not uh, a normal uh, fire, not, you know, not just in terms of the extent of the footprint, but also in terms of the intensity of, of the fire itself and what it left behind. So, um, but like I said, historically, Parks has not, um, you know, done any uh, reforestation project or undertaken a, a reforestation project after a wildfire. Uh, normally, we mitigate for erosion. We remove uh, hazardous trees that are in, uh, you know, highly visited areas, and we control for exotic species. Um, the the work itself is um, expensive. Um, it, early estimates of the project costs were about uh, 10.4 million, and uh, that was to take us through um, approximately 12, a 12 to 15 year planting phase. So, um, at the time that this fire occurred, and the time we were looking at, you know, the fact that we were seeing no recovery in terms of the, for the conifer forest in the park. Um, we really had no funds for restoration, a restoration project of this size. At that time, the state was still um, was paying employees with vouchers, as, as many of you might uh, recall and, and possibly been affected by. So, um, you know, we had uh, early discussions um, with, um, uh, and actually Mike um, attended a UC Berkeley symposium um, regarding uh, potential carbon offset um, market opportunities for funding. And um, that uh, symposium was attended by CAL FIRE uh, as well as um, American Forests and, and several other entities that began to explore um, possibilities for carbon offset projects. And it just so happened, <coughs> excuse me, that Mike Wells was, oh, I'm sorry. That's myself. Um, so it just so happened that um, Mike Wells was um, not only invited, but uh, um, actually presented at that symposium. And um, it was kind of a coalescence of a number of factors that came together that um, basically allowed us then to use the carbon offset market as a way to fund uh, this very expensive project. And I'll talk about a little bit more about that as well. Um, the biggest thing uh, that we need to talk about when we're talking about a, a carbon um, offset project is we need to um, uh, talk about addition additionality. And so um, every carbon project needs to be able to demonstrate additionality. And, and, and in this case, additionality basically addresses the question, does the project change the baseline amount of carbon sequestered? So. Um, for example, did our intervening actions, uh, will they inter increase the amount of carbon that would have been sequestered uh, without any intervention? So we could see, um, as you saw from um, Mike's presentation, that um, we could see that um, shade intolerant uh, brush and uh, exotic annuals um, were persisting and, and would be expected to persist and that it was unlikely that uh, parks could um, undertake a comprehensive reforestation uh, project because we, we really didn't have the funds. It wasn't our policy to do that. And so it was conceivable that without any intervention, uh, Cuyamaca Rancho State Park uh, would be a brush-dominated park for decades. And so those are the two points of additionality that we could demonstrate um, in terms of being able then to say, yes, this is an eligible effort for a carbon offset project. Uh, so as a result of all the players um, coming together at the UC Berkeley uh, Symposium and, and further discussions that took pla place immediately after that, we had uh, great initial support, uh, especially from CAL FIRE, 
um, expertise in, in terms of forestry. Um, we had uh, their gift and kind donations of inmate um, help with with planting and site prep work, and uh, so they were just a, a really important um, uh, partner in getting this whole project off the ground, along with, um, of course, California State Parks personnel and initial funding that, that Parks put into this project, um, a small amount of funding. And then we also had a small grant from American Forest. And um, we uh, planted uh, uh, two pilot sites uh, in about, at about, let me think, it was 2008 is when we planned. So about five years, four and a half years after the fire, um, we actually planted two um, pilot sites. And basically that was the beginning of the reforestation project. Um, the, the project itself is at the forefront of carbon sequestration in several ways. It's the first uh, climate action reserve um, reforestation project to be listed, um, verified, and registered. And that actually was a pretty intensive um, uh, three-year process from, uh, you know, from the time of being listed to the time of being um, registered by third-party uh, foresters who come out and basically take a look to um, uh, see your project design and your implementation um, on the ground and whether your imp implementation really is consistent with your project design uh, and then um, you know verifying that that we are um, you know that we have a project that even needs to be done so it's very technical it's it's, it's pretty legal and um, a, a pretty intense process. And so as a result of uh, third-party uh, um, verification, they recommended us to be registered with the Climate Action Reserve. And we were um, registered, uh, first project to be registered with the Climate Action Reserve in September of 2012. Um, so we're the first public lands uh, forest project uh, to be listed with the reserve. And we're the first, of course, uh, Department of Parks and Rec, uh, Recreation Reforestation Project as well. And just as a side note, um, the Climate Action Reserve has gone through its own series of, uh, of names and evolution uh, to, that, uh, to that agency. It used to be um, referred to as CAR, C-A-R. Um, it's now referred to as the Reserve. And it is, uh, it's really a gold standard of, um, of uh, climate or carbon offset projects and verification and registration of them. So, um, so that was a, a, a huge step for us. And I, I want to point out that, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you on this next slide. Oh my goodness, I keep, forgot, I keep <laughs> forgetting to advance my slides. So um, let me go forward a bit here. I just got all carried away. OK, so um, the um, reforestation project, uh, basically the project design is um, based on the Climate Action uh, Reserve's Forest Project Protocol version 3.2. Uh, I believe it now has a version 3.3 out, but we are registered under version 3.2. Um, our project um, is uh, provided oversight by Stephen Bakken. Uh, you guys might know some of these names. Stephen is uh, a California State Parks um, uh, registered professional forester, and he helps to guide um, different uh, forestry efforts uh, all over the state. He basically is providing um, assistance with overall project implementation. Uh, we also have uh, Timothy Robards. And he's our forest carbon um, expert. Uh, he's helped us design the baseline inventory mo monitoring protocols, and, and he does our annual carbon uh, monitoring reports. He, he just uh, is a, a great um, uh, person in terms of guidance on the carbon. I also want to mention uh, Nancy Budge. She's also a forest carbon consultant, not, uh, not a, our RFP, but uh, certainly an expert in terms of the, of the Climate Action Reserve's um, protocols and really has guided this project from early on as well. And then uh, we also have uh, Will Dorrell. Um, he's been, um, he is a, contract, um, <clears throat> a contractor who's been on site for uh, much of our planting, uh, as well as uh, the, the site preparation uh, process when it comes to uh, hand clearing. And I'll go into that a little bit um, more uh, detail in a few minutes. Um, 
But basically, it should also be noted that uh, we're registered on the voluntary carbon market, which is not the same as the compliance market. The compliance market is regulated uh, by the um, AB 32, and we are not uh, under that same, um, you know, that we're not under a compliance market. We're on a voluntary carbon market. Um, let me advance here. The, um, some of the goals uh, of the restoration project is, uh, of course, to restore the native mixed conifer forest. And um, uh, part of that, of course, will be to restore the biodiversity and ecosystem functioning. So for example, uh, prior to the fire, we had five to six uh, nesting pairs of um, spotted owls um, that were um, inhabiting the park. And uh, since the fire, we have not uh, seen any. Um, and we do um, conduct bird surveys now twice a year, so we're still looking for some return of, of some of our species that left the, the park. Uh, you know, we're not are not being seen in the park yet. Um, we also uh, manage for uh, threats of wildfires, uh, disease, and invasive exotics. Uh, basically, by the, our project design and, and uh, actions that we take um, when we're doing site prep, and exotics might come in. Um, we, we keep an eye on those and um, remove them as, uh, as we can. Um, w the project will also contribute to um, watershed protection. And because um, we're uh, a public park, uh, I think Mike mentioned that we're, um, we're uh, within a two hours drive of three million people. So it's a well-loved park. It's, it's visited quite a lot. And, um, but basically, it's important that we're also enhancing our uh, recreational opportunities there and providing um, education and research pro uh, opportunities as well. Um, and then, of course, uh, the, the project will provide uh, long-term uh, climate benefits. So um, I, I want to just uh, kind of go over the, the, some of the project considerations that are different because we're a state park different um, from, of course, uh, being a private uh, lands project, as well as different from being uh, even a Forest Service, U.S. Forest Service project. But uh, basically, um, some of the considerations are, um, um, our funders are aware that this is, first and foremost, an ecosystem restoration uh, project. Um, all of our implementation decisions are made in the context of ecosystem restoration. And as such, uh, we are not maximizing carbon as the, the ultimate goal on this project, although it is an outcome of ecosystem restoration. And all the funders have uh, signed agreements knowing that that is um, part of the, I mean, that is the, the main goal of, of this project. Um, the funders uh, who have contributed uh, to this project in, in terms of uh, the carbon, uh, carbon offset market funders. So there we have uh, funders that are um, contributing funds that are totally separate from the carbon offset ma market. And then uh, the majority of our funds raised to date, though, are from the carbon offset ma market. And our funders um, receive a, only a percentage of the total carbon credits, not, not a specific amount. And um, that's also um, very clear, made very clear to them as well. So. Um, you know, as we get into such a new um, arena with uh, carbon and forestry carbon specifically, um, you know, you just cannot guarantee any, any, um, any specific amount in, in the long term. So uh, percentages is the way that we went on that. And um, the other thing is um, no timber um, harvest operations um, are allowed on, on parkland. So, so we're not doing any salvage lumber, um, anything like that. So um, that is not an, an opportunity for us, um, in the, you know, even without a carbon project. And then um, the third really important part is um, we have a huge public investment in the park. Like I said, we're in the, in the midst of three million people. Um, uh, we're not far from uh, the residents in uh, Los Angeles, which is uh, basically three hours drive of 15 million people. So um, it's hugely, um, it just has a huge um, public investment in the park. And um, that really guides uh, a lot of our decisions as well. So for example, um, when it comes to site prep, uh, we are not using any chemicals for site prep. And it was, um, 
you know, as I was listening to uh, Bob Renierson last week, it was um, very interesting because, uh, you know, I just look at that and I think, wow, it would be so much easier, so much less costly. If we could use uh, chemicals, in one respect it would be easier. In another respect, it, it opens us up to great um, legal um, vulnerabilities. And so we opt um, to not use chemicals for site prep. Um, in our case, legal ramifications could basically just stop the project. And so that's one reason we decided not to go that direction. So um, this is just a, a map uh, of uh, Cuyamaca Rancho State Park. And uh, the blue crosshatch areas here, um, all of this, oh, I don't have my arrow. I have my mouse pointing. OK. So all of this blue crossed areas, um, basically from here to here, is um, what represents our potential planting sites. And um, about half of this area will be um, covered um, over the course of the project. Um, we, we don't want, um, we could not define the project areas. And, and I think Mike uh, told you it's, it's basically we're planting 2,530 acres. And um, uh, let's see. I was just reading something. I was reading my um, presenter chat here. Sorry. So um, the um, the blue grass um, hatched areas is is basically uh, twice the amount of from which we'll select our um, forest uh, our our project area. Um, now the area is almost an overlay of the pre-fire mixed conifer and pine oak woodland habitats here. And uh, so though we uh, eliminated some of those areas based on accessibility and other factors um, right, you know, right away. So this basically is about 5,000 acres and then we'll take about half of that as well. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, our factors for site selection in a minute. Okay, and so this uh, basically is a, a, a photo of West Mesa, and um, we have uh, what we're looking at here is uh, eight years uh, post-fire. Um, this basically, uh, the current conditions demonstrate the truth of this um, turning uh, basically to a brush-dominated park. Um, you can see here um, all of these remnants, the straight straight trunks, all the remnants of what used to be conifers here, and um, basically this whole area um, on the hillside is brush. That's Cianothus palmeri um, mainly. And um, it's, it's hard to tell right in this picture, but it's basically um, 6 to 14 feet high, um, uh, Cianothus. And this is typical of many of our um, project sites. Again, um, uh, as uh, last week we talked about um, we talked about uh, the need, well, several times it's been mentioned in the webinar, the need to, to do um, projects immediately after a fire so you don't run into this kind of um, uh, dense brush and the need to clear and spend so much money on, on um, uh, clearing. And uh, basically, yeah, we, de we definitely uh, demonstrate that that is a, a huge um, advantage to be able to plant immediately after the fire. So again, and this is just anecdotally, but you can find just, you know, hundreds of acres of area that's just 80% all brush uh, that used to be um, pre-fire mixed conifer forest. So um, our restoration strategy is um, basically, as Mike mentioned, to establish this first uh, planted patches um, to mimic uh, the refugia left by moderate intensity um, wildfires and uh, to recreate a composition that's similar to conditions uh, before the uh, fire suppression area era uh, with a higher uh, proportion of pines. Um, so uh, we have, um, we're, we're going to actually be planting um, Fewer shade tolerant uh, species and uh, and more pines. I'll get into the type of uh, native species that we're planting in a minute. Our target stand density will be about 100 trees per acre, although that will vary, um, of course, by by um, microsite. Um, and essentially, 
you know, one of the things that we run into, uh, you know, our, our initial planting density, of course, is going to be higher, and then uh, subsequent uh, thinning to create a well-spaced, uh, uh, healthy forest. But um, you know, some of the the, the information that I um, uh, would really, you know, really love to have better guidance on is, um, uh, you know, about how many seedlings uh, will produce specific target densities in different locations um, for, you know, a mature forest. And so we basically will be um, monitoring uh, the densities on an ongoing basis. And our carbon monitoring inventories um, will assist uh, with determining species and, and where we are on our goal to target densities. Um, our restoration tra strategy, um, our native species are, are Jeffrey, uh, uh, Coulter, and Sugar Pine. Um, you can see higher densities of those, um, those species, and then uh, the white fir and incense cedar, uh, lower species, uh, or lower um, densities of those, the, the shade tolerant trees. Um, we want to, you know, go easy on those. Um, we do have um, some... Um, Already we have uh, some regeneration of coulter pine, so we're kind of looking at in the big mix of things. So this is our species, um, our percentage densities, uh, just for what we're restoring ourselves, and then in terms of conifers. And then we'll also, um, you know, as we look at the big picture, we'll see how our uh, oaks are doing and, and other species as well. And uh, as a side note, our oaks, um, survived in the park uh, at about 86%. So they did not take uh, as hard a hit as the conifers did. So annual project activities, um, quite a lot of things going on all at the same time. Uh, basically, um, all of these processes are uh, interwoven. Um, for example, at our site prep meetings um, this year, we're actu actually discussing methodologies and, and site selection for uh, not just 2014, but 2015 and 16 as well. Um, it's a three, basically a two to three year process that involves all of the um, stages of site selection, um, as well as you know, uh, seed collections and surveys and all of that. So basically, um, every year if we have the opportunity to collect seeds, um, we do and. Uh, you know, uh, we have great guidance from um, Terry Griffiths on that. Uh, she's been with us from the start, I believe, uh, but, but certainly for many years um, since the project began and is really guiding um, us in terms of when to collect and, and uh, her ex expertise has just been excellent for us on that. Um, site uh, selection, of course, is a, is a long process. Uh, I'll talk about that in a minute, but um, it also involves uh, botanical, avian, and archaeological surveys. Our, our park is extremely um, uh, populated with uh, cultural um, artifacts and archaeological sites. Um, we have several archaeological um, preserves, uh, or cultural preserves, they're, they're defined as. Um, and, and, but essentially, we have to conduct um, surveys many times um, in, in different seasons and, um, you know, depending on if uh, we conduct our initial um, arc survey and it's too dense for them to get in to the interior of the site, so they conduct a preliminary survey, then they have to come back in after we've cleared some brush and it's, we still have biomass on the site and um, they'll check again, and then they come back again after we've burned it um, to check again just to make sure that we're not disturbing any archaeological sites um, through our site prep process as well, all the way actually through planting. Uh, we do conduct baseline carbon surveys, and um, I'll talk about those in a minute, uh, and site preparation, planting, seedling protection, and monitoring. Um, but that's not all. Uh, we'll, we do um, annual carbon um, uh, reporting. Uh, of course, we have communication with uh, funders and stakeholders, and then um, uh, interpretation um, in terms of you know brochures and, and website uh, presence, fundraising, uh, tours, and presentation. And then, of course, again, public uh, request act, uh, legal. Um, requests have to be handled for for um, the public who you know the public that needs um, information and and um, has you know comments for us regarding the, our methodologies. 
so um, this is my cone collection, which I talked a bit about. Um, I, I must say that um, while we try to be available or, or be um, prepared to conduct site um, uh, cone collection twice a year, uh, this is the first year, a couple a week or so ago now, that we've uh, been able to collect uh, coulter pines, and we're excited about that. We've uh, collected Jeffrey and sugar uh, pines uh, quite a lot in the past, but uh, this is the first good um, uh, coulter pine collection that we hope is as good as we we think. Um, so with respect to our site selection uh, process, we basically are nominating, uh, are nominating our, our planting polygons. And so this is another um, point of um, consideration. Um, you know, our, our, our sites are selected, they're not contiguous polygons. Uh, at least to, to start with. So um, we're looking and, and basing our, our site selection based on slope and aspect and elevation, of course. Also distance to our uh, nearest viable seed source. So you know uh, the surviving um, canopy on Cuyamaca Peak is a consideration of you know what we what we plant below that. Um, distance. I'm sorry. Accessibility uh, because we're planting. We plant in the winter. We plant um, uh, basically the second or third week of January is the best time for us to plant. Um, it's a great in terms of, normally great in terms of precipitation. Um, and so even though, you know, we have had snow on the ground, it's, it's been minimal in the past, and uh, we've had good success with planting at that time of year. Um, accessibility, um, so that is a consideration when we're talking about snow as well. Um, facility infrastructure, you know, what's, what might be, you know, pipes that might be beneath the surface as we're doing our site prep uh, near campgrounds or other structures. And then, um, of course, our botanical and cultural survey work. We're going um, to, we're going to el eliminate anything that um, needs to be, uh, you know, kept protected and not disturbed um, by our activities. Um, Uh, we do use uh, Google Earth as well uh, as we're looking for uh, our sites and evaluating them. Here you'll see that um, we're our, our polygon line right here, this pink line is kind of faint, but essentially the polygon um, is is taking basically it's the the uh, lower part the, the part below the um, um, the green line is where we're going to plant. We've eliminated this. Um, green riparian area. We kind of gave ourselves a little buffer here. You can see still some, some pines here, but we're eliminating them from the polygon and, and giving that uh, riparian area a buffer. Um, again, the site surveys. Um, while we're conducting surveys, um, we're conducting uh, these mostly after we've identified and we're pretty sure, you know, where we're going to where we want the polygon to be, um, we go in there and, and have um, surveys done. Um, while we're doing that, of course, we're, we're identifying what our species composition and density will be for that site. Uh, we're ordering our seedlings uh, 12 to 14 months in advance and determining our site uh, preparation methods, which are determined by, you know, do we have cultural um, artifacts uh, close by or potential for finding more under the brush. All right. Um, carbon stock monitoring occurs um, uh, basically every time that we, uh, for every for every um, area that we are going to um, uh, consider site prep for, we have to consider whether we need to do carbon stock monitoring for that area as well. Um, we're looking at, at the carbon stocks in standing live trees, uh, standing dead trees, uh, lying deadwood, any re natural regeneration, and then, of course, the uh, shrub and forb cover. Um, and we have uh, specific protocols for that that we um, measure those carbon pools for. Um, I talked about this already. That slide's out of order a bit. Um, okay, so we do uh, uh, site prep in terms of mechanical mastication 
um, when we put our contracts out, we're looking for um, to um, use uh, site prep methods that are not going to um, have a great soil disturbance. And so we're, we're, um, we consider um, carbon emissions um, when we're, when we're um, evaluating carbon um, for the big picture of the carbon uh, project. It's automatically put into the, the calculating um, methodology to um, account for any carbon emissions uh, through site prep um, work. Um, we, we try to uh, use um, mastication equipment that's smaller. We ask for the use of uh, articulating boom. Um, and then we're, of course, working on along the core contours of the, um, the slope as well. Um, let's see. Oh, um, because we are actively removing carbon, so once, once we um, masticate, we're actually um, basically going to burn as well, and we're required to leave on the site uh, no less than two metric tons of carbon per acre, or about 1% of standing live tree carbon stock, um, whichever is higher. So basically that, that is roughly equal to about six mature trees uh, per, uh, per acre. Uh, of course, depending upon the species of uh, standing um, of standing dead wood. Uh, we also use site prep uh, in terms of um, chainsaws. We use hand crews to to help us clear some of the sites, especially in cultural preserves and other areas where uh, the the sites are particularly sensitive. Um, then we we have uh, professional uh, hand crews go in and uh, cut with uh, chainsaws. They do a lop and scatter um, and basically just leave the biomass uh, on the ground and then we do a broadcast burn of that. Uh, what we find is that, of course, it's a less, less impact to the site. It's much more expensive by about uh, two and a half times uh, more costly than mechanical uh, mastication on an average. And then, uh, of course, we're using experienced forestry crews um, which is more expensive, but it's still more cost effective than using less, ex less experience or less motivated crews. Um, uh, it is exhausting work, and so um, the professional crews are well worth uh, the cost. Uh, again, uh, as, as Bob pointed out last uh, week as well, we use professional uh, planting crews. Um, they're, uh, they're able to provide you know, a much uh, faster, more efficient uh, planting operation. Uh, there's less trauma to the seedlings uh, because they're, they, they have the transfer, the transfer time from the nursery to the ground is just so much less for the most part. Uh, they do, um, which basically that's, that's less trauma to the seedlings. It, it results in increased uh, survival rates. And uh, the crew also installs uh, seedling protection measures. Um, again, because we don't use uh, 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 chemical herbicides, um, we are uh, protecting the seedlings um, in two ways, and um, I'll talk about that in a second. But um, essentially, we were using uh, inmate crews, and it, it did take um, much longer for them to plant, partly, I think, because they weren't um, experienced at planting, but also um, they have a shorter work day, and so uh, it takes them many more days to, to finish um, pu uh, putting the seeds in the ground. Um, so that's one reason that we went to professional uh, planting crews as well. Uh, so we don't always site prep our areas, and uh, this is downslope of Quimaca Peak, um, planting in uh, January, February, and um, Basically, through uh, February of 2013, we planted approximately 1,200 acres that um, uh, we've had uh, approximately 300,000 seedlings planted as well. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, the, let's see, the um, planting season for this year, which we've really run into uh, a delay and are considering potentially not planting. And I did talk again to uh, Bob uh, last week 
on the call, one of his comments was that we should plant um, during uh, drought years. And so I called him and talked to him about our specific situation here in Southern California. Um, we, we essentially have our average precipitation between December 1st and uh, the end of January is about 10 plus inches. And this year we had 0.22 inches uh, of precipitation. Um, by the end of February, we would expect to have 17.2 uh, inches, and currently we have 0.71 or 2, something like that. And so my question to Bob was, um, how serious are you about planting during a drought season? <laughs> and he, uh, of course, said, no, that, that would not be a good idea for us to plant at this point. And so we, unfortunately, right now have seedlings that have been uh, pulled from Placerville Nursery in early January. They are still in our refrigerated um, trailer right now at 33 degrees with some um, buckets of water in there to keep the humidity up. And I wasn't... Um, I, I'm still looking for any comments, if you want to um, provide any comments regarding um, the amount of um, soil moisture at the root level uh, that should be in the ground if we're going to plant this year. Um, we're working with NRCS um, at this point to, to try and measure uh, in, you know, in ground soil uh, moisture. Um, but really, I don't know, uh, I don't have a guideline for about how much we should be looking for at the root um, level. So if anyone wants to comment on that, that would be um, helpful for us. And um, with that, I'll talk about our seedling protection measures right now. We are using uh, shade cards. Uh, as you can see here, the um, six, six by eight inch uh, shade cards on the south side of the seedling and then this uh, biodegradable mulch mat. And um, that mulch mat is doing, of course, two things. Um, one is to keep the uh, condensation uh, under that uh, mat uh, closer around the, the, the root uh, structure, but also um, uh, preventing uh, uh, competition from the uh, adjacent uh, vegetation. Um, you know, surprisingly, um, we have seen and, and this is just a, a 12 by 12 inch uh, mulch mat, but surprisingly we have had uh, a really good um, bump in our seedling success rate in um, difficult areas like this that we're, that we're seeing with this high amount of vegetation and grasses. Um, we are still getting uh, upwards of 70% uh, survival on that. And then at some of our higher uh, elevations with um, uh, the, the, the root structure of uh, Ceanothus uh, still around the seedling um, that's been masticated and burned. And so we have uh, you know, maybe three to six inch stops uh, surrounding the, the seedling site. Um, we're getting about 94% uh, survival on those upper elevations. So um, we are very uh, grateful for these two protection measures that, are, that seem to be working well for us in the midst of um, lack of chemical um, uh, site prep methods. So we have, um, let's see, our, our biological monitoring uh, occurs every um, year at this point in the fall. Like I said, we are uh, assessing our progress towards our target density as well as the efficacy of uh, protection measures. This um, upper Green Valley 70% uh, um, survival rate is that that's what we were um, uh, finding with Actually, we were finding that was similar with just the shade card, um, but certainly both with the shade card and the, and the um, mat, we had about 70%. And um, of course, we're thinking uh, weather is the highest uh, correlation, but also the amount of biomass and rock uh, on the site uh, also had a positive correlation with seedling survival. And um, let's see. So again, uh, long-term benefits, we're looking at wildlife, uh, habitat restoration, um, watershed protection. I think I said this part, so let me skip ahead here. Um, oh, I just want to say the project is located uh, within three watersheds. Um, let's see, we have about, as you can see, we had a lot of um, 
uh, grasses, invasive and non-native grasses that we're dealing with uh, as well. And we also, let's see, it's pretty much on this slide. So again, the project scope is a $10.4 million budget through about 2020. Uh, we may you know, do some interplanting until 2023. Um, so our planting phase is 2008 to 2020. Um, again, our project was registered in 2012. We expect a, site, a second site verification um, that will have to occur before we actually um, register any carbon. And um, that site uh, verification, we estimate that that will be around uh, 2025. Um, we'll register, you know, periodically we'll, we'll do uh, site verifications and register uh, CRTs um, be from about 2023, 2025, 20, uh, something like that, to for the next um, 100 years. So 100 years since our initial planting is 2108. Um, we expect that we'll sequester about uh, 250 to 300,000 um, uh, carbon dioxide equivalents over the next 100 years. And um, of course, we have to uh, conduct ongoing forest management for the next uh, 200 years. So we'll protect that uh, carbon that's been sequestered for the, uh, an additional 100 years, which actually, if you think about it, you know, as parks is um, protected in perpetuity, so that will just, you know, go with our, our mission of protecting the park. And uh, I think that's it. Well, I tell you, Lisa, you've got a ton of questions. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation, but I, I think it's just beginning here. Okay. There's a, a few that are coming uh, into the floor right now. Let's see. Uh, Robin is asking why oaks have a higher post-fire survi survival. Uh, that was actually in the chat box. Somebody uh, already mentioned that uh, the oaks can sprout after fire. Um, do you have any other comments you want to make on that? Um, no, I, I, I think that's, uh, you know, of course that's correct. And I'm kind of, I'm seeing a lot of questions, so I'm trying to... <laughs> I'm trying to scroll back oh, up here. Oh, yeah, let me let me ask you the questions. Okay. Don't try to respond to the questions you see. Okay. I'll I'll, I'll pick the questions out that you need to respond to. Okay, great. There okay. was a whole bunch of questions about uh, forest practices, and then they're totally irrelevant to your presentation. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so, so uh, anyway, that 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 was uh, Gary was mentioning that he thought that because the oaks were sprouters. Uh, did you observe that? Uh, yes, we did, and in fact, um, we have uh, the, 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 a, a lot of them just are sprouting right, right from the stump, as well as uh, some um, ones that have, uh, you know, the, the, the oaks that have uh, survived are still putting out new, uh, new acorns and things like that as well, so yes. Lisa, but, would you like me to jump in here? Yeah, that'd be great, Mike. Okay, yeah. Um, most of the oaks have... Um, adventitious buds that are underneath the bark, at least for the live oaks, and so they sprout right from the canopy, you know, from the large branches. And then um, the black oaks will sprout from their root crowns. And so um, the mort initial mortality was a lot less, and also oaks can survive complete defoliation following a fire, and most conifers, with the exception of um, probably big cone spruce, do not. Yeah, so what are the oak species? We have black oak. Uh, what you have? Uh, do you have angleton oak there or not? Yes, we do, but in in a very very small numbers. We have mainly um, uh, black oaks, uh, Kellogg, Kelloggii, and um, uh, coast live oak and canyon coast live oak. oak. Yeah. That's the G stop problem there too. Yes, we do. Um, down in the south end of the park, we've had a pretty significant problem. Right. So you're having. Uh, you're having issues with oaks as well, um, I guess. Uh, okay, so there was a whole bunch of junk about, <laughs> I mean, not junk, discussion about uh, forest practice rules. So we're not going to talk about those. Terry uh, Griffiths is asking that question that probably nags all of you. Uh, how does the park protect contractors and the public from standing dead tree failure? Okay, well, we have a... Um a tree hazard control program in state parks, and so every public use area is exp 
is inspected for tree hazards on a frequency of about two years. Now, once we're outside of the, of the areas that are regularly visited by the public, um, on the sites where we do prep work and planting, um, part of that is, in the beginning, the contractor is required to go in and fell any potentially hazardous trees. And so that's done prior to the uh, other prep work being done. OK. Uh, yeah, Dave uh, Passavoy is um, cautioning you about um, conifers surviving fire, uh, which is, you know, is the case. Of, depends on the severity of fire, obviously. And in, in the case of well, your, your, uh, the Cedar Fire, seem to really have been one of the most severe fires that's ever hit Southern California. Um, OK, so what is the basis of limiting the amount of carbon left on the site? And I guess that means uh, in relationship to site prep. Uh, let me, what was the question again? What well, was it's the... kind of confusing. I'm not sure what it's, what there's Andy Carmen saying, what is the basis of limiting the amount of carbon left on site? OK, so I, I, I think maybe that was, uh, perhaps I said it incorrectly. Um, I think that refers to um, my uh, comment on limiting the amount of carbon loss uh, on the site due to disturbance of the soil or emissions by the contracting, um, you know, the equipment used to, to masticate. So um, no, we, we wouldn't be specifically limiting the amount of carbon. We would be limiting the amount of carbon loss. And I think that relates to, to Benjamin uh, Anderson's question. Wasn't a minimum amount of carbon to be left, I guess, uh, be restricted in the amount of carbon you could remove. That's correct. Um, so I think that also refers to um, our, the carbon pool that we needed to have a certain amount of carbon left. Even though we were burning, that's considered active removal of the carbon. And so um, we had to make sure that even after we finished burning, uh, we had at least a, a, a minimal amount of, of carbon left in standing, I think it's standing dead wood, um, and essentially it had to be um, approximately six mature trees um, per, per acre left um, on the site. Does that make uh, sense? Yeah, it does. Robin was asking, and I used to, you already addressed this to some degree, seedling survival, how did it compare in areas with and without site prep? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it does vary. And, and like I said, um, it's not just site prep that indicates or gives us an idea of how much survival, how, how great our survival will be, but also elevation because, of course, you know, precipitation and things like that vary. But um, we have our, our highest amount of um, survival at uh, right now, I think it's about uh, 55 to 600 uh, feet. Um, that's, that's on Middle awesome. Peak. And it's, I'm sorry? 6,000 feet. 6,000? Yeah. Yes. Well, sorry. Up, up to 6,000 feet. Yeah. Right, up to 6,000 feet. And it's um, uh, also site prepped area, uh, an area that had a really thick, uh, uh, dense ceanothus growth. And so it's been site prepped, um, masticated, mechanically masticated and burned, um, and then use the shade cards and the mulch mats. And that's where we're getting 94% uh, survival. And then at the lower elevations with us, uh, for example, um, uh, the grassy areas that I pointed out, it's up roughly, uh, roughly 70. There are some areas with, with um, lower um, percentage. But we also expect that the lower percentage areas are um, more difficult um, sites to begin with and had lower densities also to begin with. So we don't expect that to be um, you know, 100 uh, trees an acre. That might you know, come back to maybe, you know, anywhere between 60 and 80 trees an acre. And, and you know, that's something that we're just also finding, finding as we go along what that uh, site will support over the long term. Um, I have a question about the, uh, the weed maps. Um, I noticed that they've been using those at, at the Scanzo as well. Um, and my experience with them up here is that they, they don't work very well. I mean, over time, the grass kind of grows up underneath them, and then they just kind of come become like this discombobulated mess. Um, 
how how are they working for you? Are they actually suppressing weeds in the vicinity well, of the seedlings? And and Rich, sort of what um the objective is is most of the mortality in the, in the seedlings takes place in the first year after planting, and so we're not really looking for them to work um, beyond that. And in fact, we're expecting that they will biodegrade, and so they do suppress competition in that first year. And also, we're assuming that they cut down the amount of water lost from the soil surface due to evaporation. And so there was a, a significant increase in survivorship when we started using them. Oh, great. I'd like to see that. Uh, I mean, if you have some information on that, I would love to see that, because I've basically heard the opposite up here. Um, well, I, I, think, I think on. also because our precipitation is a great deal less that it's a, more of an issue here with um, both suppressing grass and um, cutting down evapor evaporation loss, that that's probably more critical where we live than, uh, than it is where you live. Absolutely. Uh, Robin's got another question here about considering uh, doing some irrigation or watering. Um, well, we, go on. And actually, we did, we did set up portable tanks and do watering on the pilot plots in the first year of the project. But as soon as we started um, planting up to 80,000 seedlings a year, that became very impractical for us. Um, and it's much more practical to use the, the shade cards and, um, and eco mats um, because they, you know, they just require a one-time uh, investment of work at, when the trees are planted, whereas irrigation requires you to revisit. And again, when you're planting upwards of 80,000, seedlings, that gets kind of tough to do. Uh, Dave's got a couple, Dave Passavoy's got a couple questions, too. I don't know if they're entering in here or not. Um, and then Stuart has got a question. How are you measuring the biomass lost due to site prep and maintenance for the purposes of your carbon project? Well, let me, let me address, basically, we're addressing let me think how to answer that. I might have to ac actually answer that in a uh, in a, a written response after I talk to our uh, our carbon consultant Timothy um, Robarts. But I I also know that um, you know basically as we're looking at our carbon um, baseline, you know we're not uh, we're basically at, at the end going to take um, measurements of what what we have at the you know at the 100 year mark and and be able to gauge how much we've um, we've uh, sequestered above that baseline and I know that um, with respect to uh, so I don't think in this case that we have to um, measure how much actually is lost through the burning um, but we do measure how much is lost through the um, through the um, emissions on the equipment and um, uh, basically ensure that we're not disturbing the soil so, so we're not having to track our soil loss. Uh, you know, we're not disturbing the soil to a great degree. So we have some leeway in terms of our soil disturbance, but if we agree not to go over that um, amount of disturbance, then that is not something that we have to track. So I, I don't know if that answers it fully, but I can get a, a more... Um, a more detailed explanation as well um, in the written responses. Yeah, um, I, there's a question here about the seed mats. The cost per thousand. You might not have that right at the top of your. Well, I, I actually uh, let me let me explain uh, two things. We started with a product called Eco Cover, and um, we had a local source out of Huntington Beach, um, and I I, I unfortunately. Um, they went out of business, and we we switched over to a product from Sunshine Paper uh, last year, and we'll we'll use it again this year if we plant. Um, it's a thinner paper, so we have to use two mats, um, and it basically I, I thought it wasn't going to work because it, it it was just a construction paper type of thickness. I thought it would just disintegrate in the, in the rain. Um, but it didn't. It held up very well. But we did use two mats uh, of that. And the Sunshine Paper mats at 12 by 12 um, were $0.18 cents a piece. 
so of course you know 36 cents a seedling for the for the paper mats and we were we order ours uh, in quantities of uh, i think this year we placed it for 140,000 um mats uh, so um, they are very interested in, um, you know, being able to supply more to the forestry industry. This is the first time that they've, they've uh, supplied them for forestry that's mostly been used for agriculture until, you know, just our, our first application. So uh, if you need contact information for that, I'd be happy to pass that on to you. Uh, yeah, Anderson down at uh, Descanso has been using this poor mats, and they run uh, uh, $133 for 100 so roughly a dollar thirty each, mm -hmm. um, and she's been having pretty good success with them, I guess. But um, again, up here, I think they've been using this pour as well, and I don't think they've been working as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave, Dave Passavoy is asking about the um, the hundred trees per acre, and that's based on uh, on uh, Whistlin's work. Yeah, actually, Whistlin, the mean of his plots was about one hundred and ten stems per acre, and so. Um, we're shooting at a target that's slightly less dense than that. Okay. Oh, here's a here's one that's going to knock you out. Uh, there's a required pre-treatment. It's from Nancy Budge. Yeah. Colleague. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that uh, that answers the question that was previously posed. Yeah, I think so. Okay. I mean, yeah. She's saying there's a required pretreatment inventory methodology uh, approved by third-party certifiers that measures removal of biomass that occurs as a result of site prep. And so, you know, I guess you're adhering to that methodology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one more question here. Well, we have plenty of time, but we have another question coming uh, from uh, Susie Huffinen. Huffinen. Um, which maybe she's with Parks, I'm not sure. Is there any policy change or plans on aggressively fighting a lightning start in your planting area? There was another question previously about, uh, you know, uh, going about, you know, the protection of your area from future wildfire. Um, and I presume that you have pre-suppression agreements with the local uh, CAL FIRE folks or fire district to control resource impacts. Is that the case? Yes, we the State Parks has an agreement with CAL FIRE, and we actually have a CAL FIRE fire station at Cuyamaca Rancho State Park. And, um, um, you, you know, actually, in terms of protecting the planting areas in the condition they are now, um, after they've been treated and prescribed fire and the seedlings have put in the ground, there's not a whole lot of risk. Um, in that mm -hmm. there's very little fuel 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 continuity, and what does come up is the Cenothus chaparral. It will come back after the treatment and the prescribed burning, but um, very young age chaparral doesn't burn very readily. So we mm -hmm. probably have maybe a a 20 year grace, grace period, and by that time the trees should be bigger. And uh, we're hoping that as they grow, they will shade out the Cenothus understory. And uh, which is not shade tolerant, and then um, we will have to do some management um, in terms of managing fuels in the future, and we would prefer that to be prescribed burning. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I just pres wonder about uh, do you have um, you know agreements with Cal Fire to minimize resource impacts as well, so that uh, you know that they they know where the cultural sites are, they know where the planting areas are. They know that they, you know, should try to avoid uh, aggressive firefighting in those areas of significant resources. Yeah, we Do you have, have those kind of agreements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have um, local wildfire management plans produced for each park unit, and then Great. those are, you know, we discuss those with local uh, Cal Fire offices, and they sign off on them as well. And we also have resource staff that that come uh, to the Incident Command Center and help to, to guide things from there as well um, in terms of, uh, you know, avoiding impacts to, to resources that can be avoided. Yeah. That's, uh, that's planning that I think, uh, I mean, I'm going to toot my own horn here. 
but I think that's planning that uh, local conservation organizations, land trusts, and so on should really uh, engage in, and that they don't. I know state parks does, but uh, they really need to because they have resources they need to protect as well. Um, Mike DeLaSalle is uh, saying that I should announce that today's recording and last week's uh, recording by Tompkins won't be processed until next week. Uh, so if you want to view them on YouTube uh, at the website, you'll have to wait till next week. Oh, uh, Mike's got a question of his own. How many acres have been planted so far, and how many are will be planted? So we have um, 1,200 acres planted as of last year, and um, potentially another 100 acres this year if uh, the planting goes through. And um, it's looking less and less likely uh, that we will be able to plant, but um, always keep a, a positive outlook there in case things turn around. Um, we're almost halfway through the planting uh, process. We'll, we'll plant um, essentially uh, 2,530 acres um, is the project size that we're aiming for. Great. Uh, so if, I'll give you a couple of minutes to see if there's any more questions. Uh, otherwise, boy, you really uh, opened my eyes to what's been going on down in Southern California. I mean, the I don't know if similar efforts have been undertaken on other mixed conifer land, uh, have they? Not, not to my knowledge. Of course, this, the, um, I, the area that I believe that was burned in the station fire up in Los Angeles County was extensively replanted, but it was an effort that was done just in one year. And as it turned out, it wasn't a very uh, good year for planting. It was very dry, and so they had very high mortality. And one of the when we discussed this project in the beginning, we decided to spread out our planting over several years, sort of increasing the probability that we would get at least a few you know, good precipitation years in there. And we how have about, done... How about Palomar? Palomar, we, did they do it? Well, you know, we Palomar um, was burned in the um, Pumacha fire in 2008. And that, for us, was... You know, after the Cedar Fire and the consequences of it at Cuyamaca Rancho State Park, we launched an active fuel management program at Palomar. And um, as the Pumacha Fire burned up the side of the mountain and into um, Palomar Mountain State Park, it went into the fuel management area, and we were actually able to backfire from there. And so the, we, had most, we had almost complete canopy survival within the park. Um, the fire once it hit the fuel managed areas lay down. And so in that sense, it was kind of a, a success for our fuel management program there. A real testament to fuels management is effectiveness, eh? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yes it was. Good. Uh, OK, we'll give you more another minute here. Then we'll let you all go to lunch. OK, so uh, yeah, in the meantime, if there's, uh, I'll just take a moment to say that uh, yes, I do know that um, RPF is a uh, registered professional forester. I'm so sorry about that. I, I wasn't thinking, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but yes, I, I do know that. And also, um, uh, you know, with respect to uh, forest practice rules, and I, I know I, I didn't catch hardly anything regarding the, the, the things that the discussion going on with chat in, in res with respect to that. But I do know that um, as we hire contractors, that is um, a statement in every single contract that we uh, put together is that the contractor needs to be um, um, uh, adhering to forest practice rules in terms of fuels management uh, work and planting and everything else. So um, you know, we have that, that uh, understanding as well. Apparently, uh, you know, there was a, a sort of a side conversation going on about that. And uh, apparently, there is a specific section of the forest practice rules that exempts state parks from mm -hmm. the forest practice rules, although they do have to, even if you're exempt, you still have to adhere to them uh, through the CEQA process. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike Taylor So is asking about, um, see, saying it. 10 million acre, 10 million dollars. It's uh, 4,100 dollars per acre, um, but that's for the whole shooting match, right? Yeah, yeah. That that's for the whole thing. Everything. That's um, not just planting. That's everything. That's monitoring. That's 
uh, adhering to the protocols and mm -hmm. all that stuff, right? All the all the public education and public outreach and tours and uh, yeah. legal everything. So yeah. Uh, could you actually boil it down in terms of what your planting costs are per acre? Yes, and in fact, um, some of, I mean, we're in that process right now. Um, some of our uh, uh, third party donors actually are, are holding some of those funds off site, so they're not part of the state park system until they actually come into that. And um, we're in the process of um, getting all of the um, uh, documents from off site together and, and really putting together some, some really robust figures on on you know the different aspects of planting as well and, and I just uh, want to say that the costs are are highly variable from site to site because right. of the cost of different techniques of preparation and I, I just want to say this in terms of the cost um, versus the carbon credit values um, we're not cheap <laughs> yeah. you know the um, we're we're a very expensive way to get carbon credits and we and our donors are aware of that that it save you a um, a project that sequesters carbon through like methane control at a um, at a landfill is just a fraction in expense as, as what our costs are. So again, you know, we get donors that are not so much interested in the value of the carbon credits as they are in the other benefits of the project. Yeah, yeah. and let me just mention the. The, the three main uh, donors uh, with respect to carbon um, offsets, um, Disney has uh, donated 2.9 million to the project. Uh, American Forests um, is um, handling our money that's come to us from uh, Conical Phillips, and uh, that's the amount of 2.8 million. And then we have another uh, 1 million uh, potentially from uh, Poseidon. So. That's uh, you know, that speaks for our carbon um, offset um, credits uh, in terms of the carbon offset market funders. Great. Okay, um, Mike, do you want to wrap it up at this point? Um, seems like we're starting to lose people, and uh, we've pretty much covered a lot of ground with the questions here. Uh, yeah, do you guys want to? Have any last any last things that you want to say before we uh, close the meeting? Mm, I, no, I think I'm good. I and I I just like to say that um, one of the main themes of this project has been adaptive management. That you know we didn't have very many models of um, reforestation in Southern California. There's virtually no commercial forestry down here, and so as we've gone through the process and you know do our annual uh, biomonitoring of the sites, we've very much changed the techniques from what we've started with. And so, again, uh, this has been an adaptive process as we've gone through it. And I think that anybody who undertakes a project of this scope in, in this area in Southern California will probably have to take the same approach. That's great. That's uh, a, good a good role model. So Mike, uh, do you want to close it off? Sounds good. I think you covered it all, Richard. Okay, great. Uh, so tune in next week. Um, you have